Good evening, everyone. It's going to be a very fine evening indeed, trust me. It may be foul outside, but it's going to be great fun indoors. And you don't hear that very often in an economics evening. Um, my name's Stephen Robertson. I'm chairman of Business West. Um, Business West is about making the region that we enjoy uh, a place that's a great place to live, a great place to start a business, and a great place to build a business. And uh, we're very proud as part of that ambition to be a sponsor of this evening's event and indeed uh, the Festival Ideas. Uh, business West works hard to support local businesses, uh, helping, uh, I'm particularly proud of the work they do on helping on exports. Uh, we also um, are a lobbying organisation to work quietly as well as uh, a bit of work with the media to get the point of view across that business is important in creating jobs, in creating wealth, uh, and also bringing businesses together. Um, so I think Business West does a really important role here in, in the West, um, and I think it works very well with the Festival of Ideas, and I think this year has been a fine example of this festival. Um, and let me say here, thank you to Andrew Kelly for doing such a fabulous job. Say thank you to Andrew. I think we're in for a treat this evening. Um, I remember once being told that um, if you la laid every economist end to end, they still wouldn't reach a conclusion. Uh, I'm sure that's deeply untrue, and this evening I think we will disprove it in spades. Um, we've got uh, the pleasure of having with us uh, two of the finest economic minds in the country who speak with divine clarity. Whenever I meet Adair, uh, he's either just launched a book or he's just writing one. Um, and indeed, this is no exception. He just told me that uh, his new book will be ready next autumn. Um, but before that, it's a good moment to mention that uh, there will be book signing for the written works of both Robert and Adair uh, at the end of the evening, so form an orderly queue. Now, Adair Turner, now of course Lord Turner, uh, has had a glittering career at uh, McKinsey, the management consultants, director general of the CBI, chairman Merrill Lynch, chairman uh, where he did some fabulous work on uh, the Climate Change Committee, chairman of the FSA, which of course uh, monitors some of my work, um, and did some really interesting work um, when he was chairing the Pensions Committee uh, Commission. Nowadays, uh, Adair, is, uh, has teamed up with George Soros, and let me try and get the title of that uh, group correct. Um, it's the new uh, Institute for New Economic Thinking, so I can think of uh, no one better to do that important work. To help tease out uh, Dare's thinking, we have no lesser interrogator than Robert Peston, currently the BBC economic editor, uh, quite the cleverest person on television, although Andrew Neal tells me that that isn't true. Um, uh, prior to that, of course, uh, Robert worked for the FT, The Telegraph, New Statesman, Sunday Times, and probably more. Uh, he's written many books and won a veritable trophy cabinet of awards, not to mention many scoops, some of which no doubt will be mentioned this evening. Well, seconds out, Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Lord Turner and then Robert Peston. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's uh, a great pleasure to be here uh, for this uh, Festival of Ideas and the Festival of Economics. Uh, festival and economics are not two words which are often put together. Uh, a, uh, we tend to think of uh, economics as the, uh, uh, the dismal science. Um, but I think it's very important that we think about what economics can tell us about the world which we face at the moment, because it does have some very important insights. But one of the things I believe is that actually economics before the financial crisis of 2008, did a fairly bad job of telling us how the world works 
and why we were bound to face the crisis that we faced then. Uh, I was involved very much in the midst of that crisis. Uh, I've probably done a lot of things wrong in my life, but I can at least say that in relation to the financial crisis, I wasn't there uh, when the problem built up. I became chairman of the Financial Services Authority on September the 20th, uh, 2008. It was a Saturday morning, and it was five days after Lehman Brothers had collapsed, and 10 days before uh, we'd nationalized part of the UK banking system. So it was rather like becoming captain of the Titanic after you've hit the iceberg, but before you've actually sunk. But as a result of that, I spent a lot of time trying to think about what economics has got wrong in the way it thinks about the economy, and the need for us to think more deeply about the way modern economies are changing and about the source of instability and lack of success which seems to uh, face us across the advanced world uh, today. What I'm going to talk about today and then discuss with Robert is what I call four big trends. Um, what I've deliberately done, and there is a, a sheet in front of you, uh, though I have to say the organizers have only provided one sheet for every two of you. This is a very a good piece of uh, environmental a, uh, responsibility. Uh, there's a little bit of sharing. Uh, I've set out on that chart uh, four big trends. So please look at the size of the chart, uh, which has uh, four exhibits on it. What I've tried to do there is set out four facts which I think need an explanation, and where, if we think about those facts, some interesting and, I think, somewhat non-obvious things about the shape of modern economies become clear. The facts are, first of all, in the top left-hand corner of the sheet you're looking at, very significant rise in inequality. In the top right, a very significant increase in what's called the wealth-to-income ratio, and that chart is taken directly from a very famous book which has come out here this year by Thomas Piketty called Capital in the 21st Century. The top left shows a dramatic increase in leverage in the level of debt to GDP, and the bottom right shows a dramatic fall in real interest rates. What I'm going to try and do is explain why those things have changed so much, and what implications then might follow, both for economic theory, for the way we have to think about economics, and for some aspects of economic policy. And in particular, I'm going to suggest that those four facts challenge, at very least, four things that you might think, or at least economic, economics undergraduates might think, are obvious. The sort of things that an economic undergraduate might think uh, are clear are, first of all, that business value, business wealth, is created by investment, and that people get wealthier because they save more. That might seem obvious. The second point is that banks take money from savers and lend it to businesses to fund capital investment. Well, that might seem obvious. The third is that we're in a new economy of digital capability, information and communication technology, and that therefore physical things are less important. That might seem obvious. And the fourth, it is hoped that new technology provides productivity growth, provides an increase in prosperity, and that after a while, everybody shares in that increase in productivity. That may not be obvious, but at least we hope that it is the case. But I'm going to suggest that in order to understand our modern economy, we have to challenge all four of those assumptions and understand some slightly non-obvious and non-intuitive facts. Let me begin by the one which is in the top left-hand side of the quadrant, which is rising inequality. What that chart shows figures drawn from the US is a quite startling increase in inequality over the last 30 years in the US. In the last 30 years, the bottom 20% or 25% of the American people for 30 years have received no increase in real wages whatsoever. Real wages are exactly where they were in 1980. While you can see the top line there, the position of the top 1% is that their 
wages, we don't tell to call them wages when it's in the top 1%, have gone up by 300%. They've multiplied by three times. And indeed, if I was to show you not the poor old, relatively poor top 1%, but the really rich 0.1% or 0.01% or 0.001%, you would find that they have done uh, even uh, better. They have left the poor, relatively rich, but not really rich, top 1% uh, even further behind. We have seen a dramatic increase in inequality, both at the top end of the income distribution, the best paid people moving away from the middle, and we've seen the bottom end of the income distribution pretty much failing entirely to participate in the rising prosperity uh, of uh, America. And that is not just in America. We have same trends, not quite as bad, but significant in the UK and in most advanced economies. So why is that occurring? I think part of the explanation is globalization. Uh, there is something about opening up a world of free capital and labor movements, which means that the relative position of somebody with relatively low skilled is reduced by the fact that there is competition from low-wage uh, labor in China. Globalization has almost certainly reduced the relative real wage rate of less skilled people at the bottom end of the income distribution. There are also, I have to say also, it's not a fact that uh, I find easy uh, to deal with because I am a fully paid up member of the metropolitan liberal elite with a set of liberal attitudes. I think immigration probably has a role to play here as well, that when you get large flows of immigration, that probably does tend to reduce the equilibrium real wage rate of the, bottom pe of the people at the bottom end of the income distribution. There are also a set of factors which are specific uh, to the high end, such as the growth of the financial sector where a lot of those high incomes are focused. There are some interesting sociological features about the nature of how top executive pay is set in a market which, frankly, is a very odd market. But the one that I want to focus on in particular is technology. I think it is possible, indeed, I think it is more than possible, that there's something about the latest wave of technology which is tending to increase inequality in advanced rich societies. Now, on average over time and over the long term, we know that as technology progresses, we are able to improve productivity, and that must make possible rising real wage rates for everybody. The cake is getting bigger, and it's a cake that we could divide so that everybody enjoys it. And over the very long term, that has always been true of the market economy, of the capitalist economy, but it is the very long term. There's a very fine article being produced by some economists recently, which is called Engels' Pause. It's named after Friedrich Engels, who in the mid-19th century produced a famous book called The Condition of the Working Class in England. And Engels basically argued that industrialization had impoverished the working class in England. And actually, the figures that they look at suggest that that is the case, that from about 1800 to 1850, which they define as Engels' pause, although there was very significant technological advance, none of the benefit of that went to the ordinary real wage earner. The second half of the 19th century was very different. There was technological advance, and there were very major real wage increases. And what this tells us is that different technologies, which have different inherent characteristics, the way that it may need to be combined with skilled labor or unskilled labor, what economists call the elasticity of substitution between capital and labor, the different particular nature of a new technological wave can sometimes truly be a flood, a force that raises all boats, but sometimes for quite a long period of time, it can be good for some people, but not good for others. And I think it's quite possible that information and communications technology is an extraordinarily powerful technology which is capable of making us all richer, but where left to free market forces alone, it also produces a very wide range in inequality. I think that is very clear at the top end, the very, very top end of the income distribution. I want you to imagine the following idea. Imagine that 30 years ago, 
Somebody had said that they discovered some magic words. The magic words were abracadabra, one, two, three, John. And when you said them, you could immediately talk and hear to John wherever he was, wherever he was in the rest of the world. They were magic words that enabled communication across the world. Well, suppose somebody had truly come up with those magic words, discovered them. Well, what would have happened in economic terms and in distribution of income terms? Well, provided she was clever enough to make sure that she'd looked after her intellectual property right, the woman who discovered that would be by far the richest person in the world. Um, Her lawyers would be pretty rich as well, because they'd have to look after the intellectual property right. I think her party organizers, her providers of luxury goods provisions, uh, they'd be doing pretty well. But nobody else necessarily would make any money out of this invention at all, because as I have described it, it's complete magic. Abracadabra, one, two, three. Now, a crucial thing to understand about some aspects of modern information and communications technology is... They're not magic, but they are closer to magic than some of the earlier waves of technology, such as uh, electromechanical technology or the technology of the internal combustion uh, engine. So think, for instance, about Mark Zuckerberg and the equity value of Facebook. Facebook floated for an equity value of $170 billion, right? It was created in about five years. And when I've tried to work out how much capital investment had to go into creating Facebook, how many people had to devote their economic activity not to producing current goods and services, but to producing something for the future, my best estimate is about 5,000 person engineer years, engineer person years. As a level of capital investment, that is absolutely trivial compared with the capital investment that Henry Ford had to devote before he had a factory capable of producing Model T Fords, when you allow for the machinery that he had to build and the steel foundries that had to exist before the machinery uh, he could build. So what's going on here? What is going on here is that information and communications technology is an extraordinarily unique technology in three ways. First, it has within the core of the hardware of technology a pace of productivity advance far more rapid than any previous technology. By the law which Gordon Moore, one of the founders of Intel, produced, the physical productivity that we can get in the capacity of either a fiber optic communication or the processing power or the memory of a computer tends to double something like every 18 years or uh, 18 months or two years. Every two months we double the capacity. That's why if you've got a mobile phone in your pocket, it has many, many times as much computing power in that mobile phone as all the computing power in all the computers with which NASA put people on the moon in the 1960s. This pace of technological advance is extraordinary. It is far more rapid than in the electromechanical era, the electrical era, internal combustion engines. That's one factor. The second factor, and this is crucial to my little story earlier, is that in software, once you've created one copy, a billion copies don't really cost you anything more. The marginal cost of replication is zero. And that, again, is unique in most aspects of technological uh, history. The third is that there are extraordinary powerful what are called network externality effects that we all use, or many of us use, Microsoft Word, not because it's, or Microsoft Office, not because it's the best software available, but because everybody else uses it. Everybody uses Facebook because everybody else uses it. That once you have a dominant brand name, you become totally dominant. These are reasons which explain an extraordinary explosion of inequality at the top end of the income distribution. 
In addition, however, this doesn't have just apply to the high-tech area. There's something about the modern world which produces extraordinary term returns to celebrity and brand. Ask yourself, why is David Beckham so extraordinarily rich compared with Stanley Matthews? Stanley Matthews, I hope there are some people old enough to know who Stanley Matthews was, uh, the great uh, footballer of 1950s Britain, never achieved a standard. Of, he lived a perfectly nice life. He had the lifestyle of a sort of, you know, up and middle class person, or someone like a doctor, etc. Uh, but he was never the super rich. But uh, uh, David Beckham's a billionaire because there's something about the modern economy which creates enormous returns to brand and celebrity. Meanwhile, at the other end of the distribution, however, there's something about information communications technology which is automating away more and more jobs. There's an interesting piece of uh, analysis I came across recently, which is the probability that computerization will lead to job losses over the next 20 years. Telemarketeers, 99%. Um, retail salesperson, 92%. At the other end, uh, personal trainers, uh, less than 1%. Seems likely that we don't quite know how to automate a personal trainer. I have to say there's a very worrying, and I know you'll all be very, very worried uh, about this one in the middle, economists, 43%. <laughs> now, I, I think we can all agree that's very unlikely because economists do such incredibly clever things uh, that you can't possibly replace them. But the key thing is, when you think about all the jobs that could be automated, there's a huge number of them. We have an extraordinary ability which, at one level, is hugely creative for wealth potential, uh, to automate away jobs. But it doesn't necessarily mean that everybody will benefit from it. If you go back to Engels' pause, what we fundamentally automated was the processes of spinning and weaving, and it was a disaster for the handloom weavers of early, 20th, early 19th century uh, Britain. So where will jobs come from? I don't think that there is a lack of jobs. I think there is something about, I'm enough a believer in a free market economy to believe that as we automate away some jobs, we will create others. But I simply don't think we can have any certainty that those jobs will have the sort of real wages that we want them to have. One of the best sources of information for where will jobs come from is produced by the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. Every couple of the years, they show where are the jobs being created in the economy, and they forecast where will jobs be created over the next 10 years. And if you look at their forecasts for where jobs will be created, you'll find that for all our excitement about the IT industry, the total number of people who can possibly make their living as IT specialists and app developers and game developers and software developers. Well, that's minute. It's minute because of what I said earlier, the zero cost of software replication. You don't need many people to do all of that. So where will the jobs come from, according to the BLS, which has been pretty good at forecasting this in the past? From a whole load of what I call high-touch jobs rather than high-tech. From things like personal trainers, or waiters and waitresses, or social care workers, or the person who parks your car when you turn up at a uh, nice hotel, or the person who shines your shoes at a, a, an airport. A whole load of things which exist because they cannot be automated. Hairdressers. Um, so far, we're not clear we've got a robot that can do hairdressing. I'm going to be a little bit cautious before I put myself uh, under that person's, that robot's direction. But the crucial thing about these jobs is most of the jobs that are coming forward in this modern, supposedly high-tech economy turn out to be high-touch, but they're not necessarily high-paid jobs. So when I think about the present and future economy, I think about it is both high-tech and high-touch. It's about robots and ops, but it's also about brand and design and high returns to celebrity. It is, I think, unfortunately, about rising inequality, and it is about extraordinary wealth creation with very, very little investment required to create that wealth. Now think about the second fact. 
view. It's taken straight from Thomas Piketty's book. What it shows is the increase in the world wealth to income ratio. So wealth is how many assets we own, our houses, our bank accounts, uh, our pensions, our equity. Income is current income. And you can work that out for an individual and you can work it out for a nation and you can work it out for the world economy. And what Thomas Piketty has pointed out, and it's a remarkable piece, whatever you think about his final conclusions, it's a lovely, wonderful piece of empirical economic analysis. He's pointed out that the ratio across all advanced economies of wealth to income has increased quite dramatically over the last 50 years. In about 1950, that ratio tended to be about two to three, and it now tends to be about five to six. But there's a very interesting point about where that wealth has come from. And it's illustrated on the color chart, which is on the backside of your, uh, your piece of paper. What it shows is that the vast majority of that increase in wealth is explained by one thing. I think it's the green wedge, if I remember rightly. It is real estate, the price of houses. Back in the 18th century, as is clear from that chart, Wealth was dominated by land. Land in the sense of the factory that produced food. Land as a factor of uh, production in food, uh, in food production. But now wealth is dominated by real estate, and in particular by urban real estate. And not only is it dominated by that, but it dominates the increase. In Piketty's figures, pretty much all of the increase in the wealth-to-income ratio in all advanced economies is explained by an increase in the value of real estate. And if you then say, well, where did that increase in the value of real estate come from? It didn't come from the fact that we invested a whole load in no bricks and new bricks and mortar. It came from the increase in the value of the land on which the house sits. I suspect that that will be familiar to most people uh, in this room, that if you think about the value of the house that you either own or rent, for most of you, or at least for many of you, it'll be exactly the same bricks and mortar as it was 30 or 40 or 50 years ago. You may have put in a new kitchen, you may have put in uh, new central heating, but that's not what has taken the value, the average value of the British house from a few thousand in 1950 to a few hundred thousand uh, today, what has take, uh, driven that increase is the increase in the value of land. Now, why is that occurring? Why in this world, which we call high-tech and immaterial, where value is meant to derive from software and games, why is it we are seeing such an increase in the value of the most physical thing of all, which is land? I think the explanation is following. Part of the explanation is what economists would call an income elasticity of demand. Things which have a low income elasticity of demand are things where when your income doubles, you don't buy twice as much. When people get twice as much income, they don't buy twice as much food. When they get twice as much income, they don't buy twice as many clothes when by people have twice as much income, they don't buy twice as many washing machines. On the whole, for most of us, there's a limit to how many washing machines we want to own. One seems perfectly adequate uh, for me. But one of the things which displays a high income elasticity, where as we get rich, we devote an increasing percentage of our income to that category of expenditure, is essentially competing with one another for the ownership for the right to live in locationally desirable land. Because actually where you live, whether it's a nice part of town or a less nice part of town, whether it's closer to the countryside if you want the countryside, closer to the centre if you want the centre, that is one of the most important determinants of your standard of living. Therefore, of course, you devote a large amount of your income and an increasing amount of your income to that as you reach satiation in other categories of expenditure. But if the supply of that real estate and the land on which it sits is in inelastic <laughs> supply, if we can't easily create more of the nice parts of town 
or more of the hotels which are on the beach, not a mile away from the beach, or more of the hotels which are close to the skiing piste, not five miles away from the skiing piste, then all that can happen as we try and demand more is that the price of that goes up. And at the absolute core of Piketty's phenomenon of rising wealth to income, and at the absolute core of the way that modern economies work, I suggest is an interface between the high income elasticity of demand for locationally desirable real estate and the fact that it is in limited supply. Now, of course, we can make it in less limited supply by releasing countryside to build houses on, but some people uh, won't want that. On the whole, there are constraints to how much attractive real estate uh, we create. Now, that's part of what drives this increase in the real estate intensity of modern economies. But then there's another effect, which is the moment everybody observes that the first effect is in place, it makes absolute sense for us all then to treat real estate as an asset class in which we want to invest. Now, the extreme examples of an asset class, property as an asset class, are if you go along Knightsbridge in London and you look at this extraordinary new development called One Knightsbridge, where there are flats selling for 50 million or 100 million pounds, you will note at night that there are no lights on because nobody lives there because this ass these assets are not being built as somewhere to live in. They are being built as investment asset tokens in the expectation that over time they will go up. But if you think that that's just a phenomenon right at the top end of the global wealth distribution, it's not. Because if anybody in this room or their children or whatever has ever said, OK, I'm 25, I'd be perfectly happy not to buy a house till I'm 35, but I'm going to make sure I buy it as quickly as possible, because if I don't buy it as quickly as possible, the price is going to move away from me and then I won't be able to afford it, then they are treating housing as an investment asset class. They may be forced to be so, but that is what they are doing. And what this unleashes is a yet further twist to the rise in the increase in the value of location specific land. And we see that in the UK and that one of the biggest formal asset class increases that we've seen over the last 15 years in the UK is buy to let. The amount of our housing stock, which is owned by buy to let investors, has gone up from pretty close to zero to about 10% in, in the last 15 to 20 years. Now, why does this matter? It matters because it can give an extra twist to the inequality that I referred to earlier, because it means that people who are in a better position to get going in this uh, increase in the value of land tend to uh, a, uh, do well uh, out of it. It also matters, however, because it creates financial and economic instability. The higher is the value of wealth, and in particular real estate, relative to income, the more that our economies are vulnerable to changes in the value of wealth and real estate, where on the way up, people feel exuberantly happy because they're more wealthy and therefore they spend more and the economy booms. But when confidence shifts, the fall in wealth is big relative to their income and therefore tends to produce big responses in terms of cuts in investment, cuts in consumption, and therefore big oscillations in terms of the dynamics of the economy. But this then is multiplied by a third effect. And the third effect is leverage. What that chart shows is that private sector leverage, private debt, household or company, as a percentage of GDP, went from 50% across the advanced economies on average in 1950 to 170% on average across the advanced economies by 2007 on the eve of the crisis. This rise in leverage 
And the problem that it has left us with, which economists call the debt overhang problem, is, I suggest, the single most important reason why, after the crisis of 2007-8, we have found it so difficult to get our economies going again, whether in Japan or the US or the Eurozone. Because that increase in leverage has left a whole load of companies and individuals over-leveraged or feeling over-leveraged when the assets that they had bought fell in price. And in response to that feeling over-leveraged, they have cut their consumption and they've cut their investment, and that has driven the economy into a recession, at which point tax revenues have gone down and social expenditures have gone up, and then public debt has gone up. So that actually, if you look over the last seven years, although we sometimes talk about deleveraging and everybody paying back their debts, at the total level, leverage hasn't gone down at all. All it's done is shift from the private sector to the public sector. And if you add together private and public debt as a percent of GDP, that is actually higher now than it was before the crisis. But then when we observe public debt go up, we worry that we, how will we pay that back? So we have austerity. And at that stage, you've got both the private sector cutting its consumption and investment, and you've got the public sector cutting its consumption, and then you have a depressed economy. So that increase in leverage is hugely important. When I was at the FSA, after a time having thought about all the different reasons why in 2009, 2010, we were in such a deep uh, economic problem, I ended up that while you could argue it was crazy bankers who'd done uh, bad things, over-leveraged banks, et cetera, et cetera, the absolute core of what had gone wrong was an over-leveraged real economy. But what's interesting is that before the crisis, modern macroeconomic and finance theory really didn't worry about that increase in leverage at all. There were two subdivisions, one of which I might call finance theory and the other macro theory. The finance theory, the people who thought about what the financial system does, and the economic historians, on the whole, tended to tell a story that more credit as a percent of GDP was a positively good thing. There are bits of economic theory that tell us that if we tried to build an economy which only had equity investments, we'd never get businesses going because there's lots of people who wouldn't invest all their money in an equity fashion. They want the certainty of a debt contract before they give money to a business or an entrepreneur which is going to uh, uh, build uh, that business. So the finance theorists, on the whole, had told us a theory about the benefits of what they called financial deepening. And one of the measures of financial deepening was more credit as a percent of GDP. The macroeconomists, the monetary economists, and the central bankers, meanwhile, had ended up with a belief which, broadly speaking, said, well, the old finance theorists, they can have their theory as to whether uh, debt is important or not. To us, it's just neutral. It's of no importance whatsoever. Now, this may surprise you, but let me give you two quotes. So Olivier Blanchard, chief economist of the IMF, said in 2012, before the crisis, we assumed we could ignore most of the details of the financial system. Mervyn King said that modern neoclassical, new, new classical economics and new Keynesian economics, two subsets of modern monetary economics, broadly speaking, ignore the details of the financial system so that credit, money, and bank balance sheets play no meaningful role. What are called dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models, which are models that central banks use to think about the economy, have within them what are called representative agent companies and representative agent households, but they don't really have a banking system at all. Now, non-economists might think this rather odd. How on earth did economists tend to develop a theory of how the monetary system worked without, in their models and their thinking, having banks at all? But broadly speaking, I have to say that is what happened. Mon modern monetary theory had gravitated to the belief that we could cleverly think about the transmission mechanism of interest rates as something which sort of passed through what they called the veil of the financial system to affect the real economy, and that the size of the financial system and the level of leverage didn't really matter. Now, this is very odd. 
It depended on the following two assumptions, which if they were true, might make it reasonable to ignore leverage in the financial system, but turn out to be wrong. The first is that banks take savings from savers, particularly households, and lend money to business stroke entrepreneurs. Banks take savings, they intimate it, and they lend it to entrepreneurs. Those are my, my two statements. They intermediate, and the people whom they intermediate to are entrepreneurs stroke businesses. The problem is that as a description of what banks do in modern economies, both of those statements are pretty much entirely mythical. I'm not going to be able to explain it fully here, so this is the reason why you'll have to buy my book. Um, <laughs> banks don't take pre-existing money and lend it on to other people. They create credit, money, and purchasing power, which does not previously exist. That is an insight which is in mid and early 20th century economists like Keynes in the treatise on money, like Friedrich von Hayek, like Schumpeter, uh, like Knut Wicksell, but which broadly speaking, we forgot in modern economics. And secondly, banks, modern banks, do not primarily lend money to entrepreneurs stroke businesses to fund capital investment projects. Broadly speaking, on average, they do the following thing. To about 65% of their balance sheets, they lend money to individuals through the mortgage market to compete with one another for the purchase of housing assets that already exist. Secondly, to the extent of about another 15 or 20 percent, they lend money to either impatient consumers or perhaps just poorer consumers to be able to afford consumption in advance of earnings, consumer credit. Only about 15 or 20 percent of all lending in modern advanced economies is for the iconic purpose described by our textbooks, which is to lend money to entrepreneurs, straight businesses, to fund capital investment projects. So what we say in our economic textbooks is quite wrong, which does suggest we should at very least change the textbooks. But it turns out that this error has a crucial implication. Because when the vast amount of credit is extended against real estate, it gives an extra twist to the increasing importance of real estate to which I referred earlier. Because when you have credit extended in mortgage loans to lots and lots of people to buy homes, and if the homes are sitting on land which is in inelastic supply, the more credit is extended, only one thing can happen, which is the price of the land on which the real estate sits, and therefore the land goes up. And it goes up and up and up in a cycle of a credit and asset price cycle, until we have a crisis of confidence, and then it goes down and down and down. And the story of financial instability in the modern economy, in that story, credit and real estate prices is not just part of the story, it is again and again and again 90% of the story. And it's a story which, once you get to crisis of the scale of 2007, leaves us with a severe debt overhang effect which we really don't know how to get rid of. My fourth chart shows a remarkable fall in real interest rates. So real interest rates are the return after you've deducted inflation. And you can get that for certain if you buy a real index linked bond, which the Treasury will sell you. If in 1990 you or a pension fund on your behalf had wanted to have a good return over the next 30 years and had bought a 30-year real index-linked bond from the UK government, it would have had a return, in addition to inflation, of over 3% for 30 years, absolutely certain. That figure is now 0%. The real return available on real index bond is 0%. And even before the crisis, as that chart shows, it had already fallen to 1%. It relentlessly fell over the period from 1990 onwards. So what is going on there? Why do we have these very, very low real interest rates? Well, economics tells us that the real interest rate must go down if 
there is an imbalance between what we call ex-ante savings and ex-ante investment. Uh, after the fact, in an economy, savings has to equal investment. That's just an identity. But in terms of people's intent before the fact, ex-ante, people might want to want to save more than the people who are making investment decisions want to invest. And if there is an excess of savings over investment, then the real interest rate will tend to go down. And there may be some reasons why, in the modern economy, investment needs are actually going down. Remember, I told you the story of Facebook. There's a company which creates enormous value, but with very little investment. And not just Facebook, but every e company which is buying capital goods, which are intensive of information and communication technology, any computer, for instance, the relative price of that, relative to all current goods and services, is going down. Indeed, over the last 20 years, there's been a very significant decline in the relative price of new capital goods, the machines that businesses have to buy, relative to the price of a, uh, current goods and services. What that may mean, if we still have an undiminished desire in total to save, is that the equilibrium real wage rate goes down. But when the sorry, the equilibrium real interest rate goes down. But when that occurs, of course, that makes it cheaper to borrow money to compete with one another, not to build new machines and new investments, but to compete with one another for the ownership of the limited supply, real estate and land that already exist. So what I want to suggest is that in order to understand our modern economy, we have to challenge those ideas that I set out earlier. It may seem obvious that uh, wealth in a capital, in a business sense, comes from capital investment, and that wealth in a personal sense comes from savings. But actually, we live in an environment of huge equity wealth creation without investment. And we live in an environment where most of you, if you look at how much wealth you've got, may well find that by far the biggest element is the appreciation in the value of the house that you bought some time ago, uh, not how much you saved out of current earnings. We tend to believe that banks take deposits from savers and lend it to entrepreneurs stroke businesses, but that is not what primarily banks do in modern economies. We tend to believe that in the new economy, the physical is less important. But if we look at where new jobs are being created, they are above all in high-touch jobs, in the jobs which survive precisely because they are physical and require a face-to-face -face interface. And if we look at where wealth is created, we find that wealth is dominated by the most physical thing of all. And finally, we tend to believe that economic growth will spread prosperity, that technology will drive growth. Yes, technology will tend to drive growth and an increase in per capita income uh, over time. But I fear that the particular period of time that we are at the moment is one where the particular wave of technology which we are facing may have a deeply unequal effect. That all has quite a lot of implications for the future of economic theory and for the future of appropriate economic policy, but I will leave those for questions. Thank you very much. Well, I have to say it's a particular pleasure for me to listen to uh, Adair's tour de force because he's one of the few people in the world with a slightly bleaker outlook than I have. Um, <laughs> uh, and just while he draws breath, I mean, just you know, one of the extraordinary things that he pointed out, not, not actually central to his argument, was this uh, bizarre uh, practice of economists, that they pretended, in a sense, banks and the city didn't exist. And I had a, a very sort of painful 
experience of this back in 2007. You may remember uh, I attracted a bit of notice uh, when I broadcast that Northern Rock was bust and was sort of going on sort of hour after relentless tedious hour saying that the city wasn't doing its job, it wasn't able to lend. And uh, I pointed out that, you know, if banks couldn't lend, we were heading for the rocks and a pretty severe recession. And I was bombarded with hate mail from economists and MPs and ministers, all of whom basically said, no, no, you're completely wrong. All our economic models say that growth is going to continue. And the reason they were saying this uh, was because their economic models had no way of capturing what the banks were actually doing. It was completely extraordinary. Now, one or two people now don't hold me personally responsible for uh, the crisis, which is a great... Uh, a great relief, but this crisis um, in economics, which Adair um, has described, I think, you know, hasn't yet been resolved. And so uh, what I thought I would do was start with a nice, easy question for you, uh, Adair. I mean, it seems to me what you've described, if I may, is really the complete failure of global capitalism within liberal democracies. Um, it's a trivial, <laughs> trivial failure, really. Um, and so what I'd like to know is what you feel we can do about it. If we have a system in which, frankly, the rewards go to a tiny percentage of people, if you look across the European Union, the Eurozone, for example, you have countries like Spain and Greece where unemployment among young people, among young people is 50%. Right? Unemployment in this country among young people is grotesquely high, five or six percentage points above the rate for the uh, country as a whole. And young people are taking jobs on zero hours contracts. These are, you know, they're going to university and then finding that their skills aren't wanted. This is a terrible, terrible scandal. What do we do about it? <laughs> Well, in two minutes, the answer <laughs> to all the world's problems is as follows. Um, let, let me g give two sets of answers. What do we do in terms of macroeconomic management and financial stability? And what do we do about inequality? They, 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 they are linked. Um, in terms of macro stability, I think we have got to plan to run our economies in future with much less private credit, and in particular, much less private credit against real estate. Um, I, I think that it is absolutely inherent that if you look at the, the third chart there, that increase in private leverage, we were bound to end up with a macroeconomic disaster. And so I have ended up in a far more radical space than I thought I would be four years ago, of believing that uh, we should limit banks to be much less highly leveraged than they are at the moment, that they should hold capital equal to something like 20 or 25 percent of the loans they give, not the 5 percent or so, which is normal uh, at the moment. I think we should limit the ability of people to overborrow through loan-to-value uh, ratio limits and loan-to-income ratio limits. And I think central banks have to have not only the power and respons but the responsibility to lean against the growth of excessive leverage. That when they see the growth of leverage that was occurring back in 2004, 2005, 2006, I do not think that they can ever slow down those credit and asset price booms by simply increasing the interest rate. I think if you increase the interest rate, you will do terrible things to other aspects of the real economy long before you slow down the credit and asset price boom. So I think they need the power to what we call apply counter-cyclical tools, such as higher capital requirements, lower loan-to-value uh, limits, lower loan-to-income limits. So part of my agenda is a tighter control of private credit. But then you can ask, well, OK, but if I tightly control private credit, how the hell do I get out of the lack of demand that we have at the moment, the fact that we don't have enough demand in our economy and that we are now worried about the inflation rate. Uh, Mark Carney is probably going to have to write a letter to the government explaining why the inflation rate is about to go below 1%. In uh, uh, the Eurozone, it's down at about 0.3%. When inflation rates are that low, it's impossible to delever the economy. 
So we face a lack of what economists call aggregate nominal demand. So the question, given that I want to constrain the amount of credit in the economy, why then, how then do we get aggregate nominal demand? Now, I have ended up in a very radical space on that. I think it is possible to do what is called money finance of increased fiscal deficits, which means that the government can actually print money, what economists call sovereign money, uh, fiat money, and the ability to do so is actually described in economics not by some sort of mad left-wing inflation lovers, but above all by Milton Friedman in a famous article called Helicopter Money. I therefore believe that what we should have done three years ago was not the austerity that we've done, but that we should have been, as it were, sending to everybody in the economy money, printed money, money created uh, by the government to stimulate the economy. Money, which is public expenditure, which doesn't have to be paid back in the past. Now, I'm not a, there are some of you will agree immediately and some will disagree immediately, and it will take the entire chapter 15 of my new book to convince you that that is possible. But therefore, I have a set of arguments about what we do on the macro side, uh, and I think it's incredibly important that we do them in particular in the Eurozone and Japan. The, the Eurozone worries me a lot. But then the question of inequality, and by the way, the question of inequality is linked. One of the reasons why we have seen an ever more credit intensive economy, I think, is that we've also seen a more unequal economy. John Maynard Keynes used to worry that as we got richer, on average, we would face a problem of what is called secular stagnation. Because as we got richer, we'd sort of reach satiation and we'd all save so much that the economy would slow down. Now, I think empirical experience has suggested that as a statement of societies on average over time, the whole society getting richer, that has turned out not to be the case. But as it relates to individuals in society, it is undoubtedly the case that richer people have a much higher marginal propensity to save than poorer people, and that therefore as inequality increases, you have a danger that the very process of increasing inequality will tend to produce a lack of aggregate nominal demand unless essentially the rich lend money to the middle income and the poor. And that I think is a crucial part of the story of what happened in the US in subprime lending. There was a massive increase in inequality, the one that you can see on the top left of the surf chart in America, an inequality to which America did not have a successful response other than what in a great phrase the economist Raghu Rajan has labeled, let them eat credit. <laughs> I, they don't have enough income, so we'll lend them money, they'll buy houses, the houses will go up in price, They'll feel good even though their income's not adequate until the whole thing cracks and then we're in a problem. So the more unequal society has made it essential for us to have credit just to grow our economies at a reasonable level. So we've got to deal with this problem of inequality. What do we have to do about it? Well, first of all, I don't think we're going to completely solve it. I think inequality goes backwards and forwards throughout capitalism and I very much doubt we can always manage it to a particular point. But I do think we should be leaning against the tendency of modern economies to be more unequal. And I don't think we can do it simply through what I call the nice, rich, liberal, economist and FT reading approach. If you read an article in The Economist or The Financial Times about inequality, it will always go in the following form. Inequality is rising. This is terribly worrying. Uh, here's why it might be occurring. But you wouldn't possibly want to deal with that with redistributive taxation. The answer is skills. <laughs> skills is the deus ex machina of the debate on inequality. But I fear that in an environment where the determinant of who makes money from a computer game app is not absolute skill, but relative skill, the person who gets there first, the person who establishes the brand first, and where that relative skill effect is important across the economy, that skills answer is not adequate. I therefore think, and there's a pretty old fashioned sort of slightly lefty point of view, that without going crazy to the other end of a, a socialist egalitarianism, in an environment where 
the natural tendency of the economy is to, be called more, is to become more unequal. We should lean at least some way against it with somewhat more progressive taxation, both in terms of the taxation of income and in the taxation of property. The one possible internal contradiction in both your uh, prescription and your analysis, well, I think, would be, would be this. I think there's a fair amount of evidence that the money creation, not quite as radical as what you propose, but QE, yep. purchased by central banks of enormous amounts of government debt, £375 billion worth in the UK, something like four and a half trillion dollars worth in the US, um, has it essentially leaked through into the property market. It mm. has been yep. one of the big contributors yep. to the surge in property prices, which has uh, exacerbated these inequalities, uh, which you're worried about. Yep. And what I suppose slightly concerns me about part of your solution, which is actually a rather more extreme version of money creation, effectively under uh, Adair's um, prescription, the debt wouldn't just be bought by the central banks, it would just be written off. It would be eliminated. Um, wouldn't that actually supercharge the rise in the value of real assets, which would create an even bigger inequality problem uh, for governments then to have to tackle? No, I don't, I don't agree with that because I don't think that overt money finance, as I call it, helicopter money, is yet more QE. Broadly speaking, the proposition, the predominant proposition of economic orthodoxy over the last three or four years has been we've got to get the fiscal deficit under control, so we've got to have austerity, so we've got to increase taxes or, increase or decrease uh, expenditure, uh, and that will undoubtedly tend to depress the economy. Therefore, we've got to offset that with ultra-low interest rates, ultra-low short-term interest rates, which is the ones the Bank of England or any other central bank directly sets, and then very low long-term interest rates, which you achieve through the process of quantitative easing of the central bank going out and buying bonds. And when you do that, what you're trying to do is stimulate the economy through an entirely monetary mechanism. And if you ask what is the supposed transmission mechanism of quantitative easing, it isn't that it produces asset price increases as a byproduct. Yeah. The overtly stated transmission mechanism sure. is by driving down long-term interest rates, I'll drive up asset prices, and then people who have assets will feel sufficiently rich that they'll go out and spend money. That is the transmission mechanism. Now, what overt money finance does is you're absolutely right. In one sense, more radically say, the central bank can create money, um, and it doesn't need to ever destroy that money in the future because the QE is meant to be reversed at some stage by the Bank of England selling these bonds back and getting money back. With overt money finance, you make it permanent. But what you do is a smaller amount and a different amount. And if I can sum up the difference between overt money finance and QE, it is don't buy 375 billion pounds of gilts, asserting that you will sometime reverse it and trying to stimulate the economy through ultra-low interest rates. Instead, do a much smaller amount, 35 billion or 50 billion, as an overt increase in the fiscal deficit, either through a tax cut or an expenditure increase. So you'd actually do a smaller amount you link it to something which gets direct through to the individuals. In Milton Friedman's terms, you do something that directly enters the income stream, right? Because it's money in the taxpayers' accounts, or it's money in the welfare benefit uh, receivers' accounts, or it's money in an infrastructure investment. There are different ways of doing it, and you can have a debate about which is the best way to do it, but it directly, to Milton Friedman's terms, enters the income stream, it goes into the real economy, it doesn't get to the real economy through these indirect mechanisms. And that is my fundamental proposition, that I actually think that the combination that we've taken 
of fiscal austerity offset by monetary policy alone has unnecessarily exacerbated inequality, is bound to create financial stability dangers because ultra-low interest rates stimulate all sorts of fancy financial engineering in the midst of the financial system long before they get the iconic small and medium enterprise out there uh, borrowing more money, and that actually a small amount, more direct and permanent, would have a more stimulative and a safer effect. Very interesting. Um, I might come back to you on that, but, uh, but, 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 let's, but I don't want to hog this. So who's got a question? Um, I'm, I'm not an economist at all. Um, I was worried about the mechanism of QE, didn't understand how it was getting through. And what you're suggesting is a more direct funding, but by government, I think. Didn't the uh, large amount of um, uh, compensation paid by the banks yeah. for PPI mis-selling get straight into the economy in the way that you're suggesting. And wouldn't it be a jolly good idea to make the banks do a lot of that sort of thing without anybody necessarily having to prove that they deserved it? <laughs> Should we take two or three? We take yeah, two? we'll take a couple. Um, is, is there not somebody nearby? We'll, we'll take two or three at a time. Thank you very much for your uh, talk and also for the opportunity to ask a question. My question is on how economics became a dismal science. Mm. And uh, you're quite correct, and I agree uh, precisely, that in terms of mainstream economics, and financial theory and modern macroeconomic theory, there was a complete blindness to this relationship between the real and the financial, or the details of the financial. But during this period of paucity in modern or orthodox economic theory, there was a great wealth of economic analysis and theory taking place that precisely looked at financial instability, uh, increasing leverage, um, a change in the role of finan the financial sector from intermediary to a different kind of social intermediary. I can cite the work of perhaps Minsky, Eichen Green, Froud and Williams, uh, Boyer, Aglietta, people from across a spectrum of, uh, th uh, of theory and traditions. So my question is, why were these theories and ideas completely ignored and sidelined by the orthodoxy? And to what extent are they being engaged with today in our economics departments and in, in uh, policy making? Thanks. Well, on the, f on the first one, actually, I think it is clear that the very large PPI payouts have not been just important for individuals, but are sufficiently large that they're important at the, at, at the macro level. And I think it's quite interesting to think, you know, whether our economy would be sufficiently uh, further depressed if it had not been uh, for those large uh, PPI payouts. Because, you know, at 20 billion, the, these are material to the total flow of disposable income and consumption. I think I'm, I'm a little bit wary of, um, well, let's just get the banks to do a bit more whether they're guilty or not. Um, uh, because although I think it's incredibly important that we control the banking system far more tightly than we did in the past, with higher capital ratios, uh, you know, with tighter what are called reserve assets, tighter liquidity rules, etc. I do think at the end of the day, we've got to have a, a banking system which has competitive private banks uh, well run. And when you have competitive private banks well run, you are going to have to uh, let them be governed by a, a rule of law, uh, you know, and a preset pre rule of, uh, rules of the game rather than, hang on, we're all a bit short of money, can you give me some? I mean, I, I just don't think we can run a, a, a market economy like that. So, uh, yes, PPI payments have been macroeconomically important. Uh, yes, uh, we have to control the banks in an appropriate set of ways, far more tightly in the past. Uh, but no, uh, we can't think of them as simply uh, every now and then the Chancellor says, oh, the economy is slowing down a bit. Let's tell the banks to uh, give out some money. I, I don't think we can run the system like that. Now, the question on unorthodox economics. I mean, I, I'm now a, a senior fellow of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. That is my main activity at the moment. And the Institute for New Economic Thinking was set up in 2009 uh, precisely because a group of people got together and said, why did mainstream modern economics make such a, a, a mess of, of what uh, occurred? Uh, I mean, some wonderful statements on uh, mainstream modern economics. Some of you, I, I, you, you probably don't know, but there was a, a man uh, who was previously 
uh, on the uh, Monetary Policy Committee at the Bank of England called Willem Boiter. Uh, Willem is a great economist and a man of wonderfully trenchant point of views. And he has a marvelous article with the great title, The Unfortunate Uselessness of Most Modern Macroeconomics. Um, <laughs> Then, of course, there is the great, the Queen's question, who turned up at the LSE and said, well, why did no one uh, see it coming? Um, so why? You're absolutely right that even while modern mainstream economics, New Keynesian economics and New Classical economics and central bank models had, to an extraordinary extent, written the financial system out of the script, there were other people talking about the financial system. I think uh, Hyman Minsky is probably the most important uh, of those. Um, and uh, Hyman Minsky was completely marginalized. Hyman Minsky was not recognized by uh, the mainstream of the economics uh, profession. Uh, he was seen as heterodox, a bit maverick. Um, and there are some real lessons here about two things. One is dominant orthodoxies in academic disciplines. All academic disciplines can tend to have dominant orthodoxies which are reinforced through, for instance, the institutional mechanisms of peer-reviewed journals and the conferences where everybody uh, gets to uh, a, uh, put forward their, uh, uh, their proposals. And what determines advancement in faculty? Um, I remember uh, talking with uh, uh, Robert Schiller, uh, who very much on the sort of heterodox side, who wrote a number of very good books called Irrational Exuberance, uh, about the way that markets did not operate in the way that the efficient market hypothesis or the rational expectation hypothesis suggested. And he and also uh, George Akerlof, very fine economist, Nobel Prize winner, or both of them are Nobel Prize winners, will tell you that they have over the time often advised their PhD candidate students not to get too close to them because it's not going to be very good for their academic advancement. Now, we have to crack that. No, we have I, to make wonder, sure that there is always a, a, a row, a, a potential for uh, heterodoxy. The other thing that I went, think went wrong, finally, was a methodological issue. One of the reasons why Minsky wasn't rated and why people have ceased reading Friedrich von Hayek's uh, Monetary Theory of the Trade Cycle, uh, uh, Keynes's... Uh, treatise on money, Vixel's interest and prices, or indeed Keynes's general theory, is that they're not full of algebra. And increasingly, from about the 1950s and uh, uh, 60s onwards, uh, economics was subject to a sort of physics envy. Um, it <laughs> observed that the physicists were able to arrive at precise conclusions with very sophisticated mathematics. And I think it wrongly concluded that uh, that had to be the only form of economics. And the only trouble is that if you have reasonably sophisticated economics, you still have to make extraordinarily simplifying assumptions. So if you say, why did central banks develop and monetary economists develop dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models which had companies and households that not banks, the answer you will get, and I think it is a really shaming answer, is because it made the mathematics tractable. It made it possible for us to have mathematical models which solve to complete solutions. And fundamentally, economics, I think, privileged mathematical sophistication and elegance over real-world realism. And I think in Minsky and in Hayek and in Schumpeter and Keynes, there is a narrative, realistic description and an engagement with um, the way the world really is that is absent from a lot of uh, articles which were peer-reviewed and passed as fine economics. Well, sadly, I'm afraid, we are at the end of our allotted time. I'm sorry it's gone so uh, fast. Um, I've got a couple of things to say. One is you're plainly an astonishingly intelligent audience, and so I'm absolutely certain you already own these <laughs> two very fine books. But in the unlikely event that you don't own either Adair's book or my book, they're available 
at extraordinarily good value, even without the benefit of helicopter money, just at the back of the room there. Um, and secondly, the other important thing is just to thank, I want to say personally, how grateful I am to Adair for this tremendous, as I say, exposition of much of what's gone wrong. And I just think we should all put our hands together and... Um,